Well, good morning, everybody. Pastor Steve here, and thank you so much for being with me for this devotion in our Bible reading plan. We are in the fourth chapter of Ezekiel. Hope you've already read the chapter. We're going to talk about it. And what I wrote at the top of my journal for this chapter is dashed hopes. Dashed hopes, because reality can be harsh. Remember, in the first three chapters, Ezekiel has this vision of God. God speaks to him, commissions him to be a, a prophet. And um, in chapter four, he dramatizes, he acts out the message of God for the people. Old Testament prophets sometimes uh, acted out, uh, demonstrated not just an object lesson, more than an object le lesson. Sometimes they would just physically do something, and that was the message. It symbolized something. Sometimes they would speak and act out a message, and that's what's going on in here. And remember, um, he's in exile in Babylon. This is about uh, 593, 92 B.C. He's been in exile for five years. He's 30 years old. And he was taken to Babylon along with a pretty large number of Jewish leaders, political leaders, economic leaders, and so on during the, the exile that took place after the siege of Jerusalem in 598, 597 B.C. And uh, already a few years earlier in 605 B.C., a, a smaller group of Jewish exiles, young intellectuals like Daniel, had been taken in captivity to Babylon. Um, and these exiles had the hope that they would return to Jerusalem, that they would not be in exile very long. In fact, they expected to go home pretty soon. And they, we know from both Ezekiel and Jeremiah, who was preaching at the same time Ezekiel was preaching in Babylon, Jeremiah was preaching back in Jerusalem. We know from their, from their books that there were false prophets in Babylon telling the Jewish people God was going to judge Babylon and they would go home real quick. Got so bad, Jeremiah even sent a letter to the exiles in Babylon telling them, build houses and give your kids a marriage because you're going to be there a while. His message was not popular. Ezekiel's message was not popular. And in chapter 4, Ezekiel acts out a message to the Jewish people saying, it's going to get worse before it gets better. This is about 593, 92, somewhere in there. It's, he, and, and, and his message is pointing to about five, six years in the future because in 587 B.C., Babylon destroys Jerusalem and carries the majority of the people, the masses of the people, to Babylon in captivity. And they stay there till 530-something B.C. And even when they get to go home years into the future, decades into the future, only a remnant of them ever return back to Jerusalem. And, and so God tells Ezekiel to preach that message, but not with words, with actions. And he builds a model of Jerusalem being laid siege to by the Babylonians. So let's look at chapter 4, verse 1. Now you, son of man, God talking to Ezekiel, um, get yourself a brick, place it before you, and inscribe a city on it, Jerusalem. So he gets a brick, a good-sized brick. And I don't know if he draws a picture of Jerusalem or just writes the name Jerusalem on it, but, it, but it, that brick is, to, is a picture of Jerusalem. <clears throat> and then he said in verse 2, God to Ezekiel, then lay siege against it. Build a siege wall, raise up a ramp, pitch camps, and place battering rams against it all around. So using sticks and stones and other items, we don't know what all. He has this brick in the middle that is Jerusalem. And using sticks and rocks and stuff, he builds an army with ramps and everything else, attacking the walls, attacking the city of Jerusalem. It's a symbolic way. It's a, it's a physical way of preaching without saying a word that Jerusalem is going to come under siege. And then in verse 3, get yourself an iron plate and set it up 
as an iron wall between you and the city and set your face toward it. So Ezekiel being the prophet is a picture of God. And over here is Jerusalem that's under siege by the Babylonians. And he says, you get this big iron plate, okay? Put it between you and the city under siege. And it's symbolizing that God over here is not going to come to the rescue of Jerusalem. When Babylon attacks and besieges the city, they are on their own. They've rejected God. God has rejected them. They are on their own. It's like there's this iron plate between God and Jerusalem. He's not going to rescue them. He's not going to protect them. That's the message through this action he's preaching to the exiles. You've got this hope of going home soon? Not going to happen. Things are going to get worse. The city that you want to return to is going to be besieged and destroyed because God is not going to protect it. And that's exactly what happened about five years later in 587 B.C. Now, he goes on in this chapter, and God says, Now, Ezekiel, I want you to um, go out before that city that you've built there, that, that picture of Jerusalem under siege, <clears throat> and I want you to lay down on your right side every day for part of the day. And he wouldn't stay there 24 hours a day, but he would go out, and for most of the day, he would lay on his right side facing that city, and he did it for... Um, for, um, uh, or his left side, rather, his left side, and he did it for 390 days. Over a year, a year and a half, you know, over a year, every day. Um, and he said those 300, God says those 390 days is, is, is a symbol of each of the 390 years between the, from the time of the Civil War when Israel divided into two kingdoms because in the north, the 10 northern tribes of Samaria, of Israel, the northern tribes, never had a good king. From, from their inception, they worshiped idols. And, and so they were destroyed earlier by the, by the Assyrians. And he's symbolizing that, that God judged them. This, this is a picture of their 390 years of sin, a rejection of God. And then after those 390 days, he says, now flip over, go out there every day and lay on your left side and do it for 40 days, symbolizing the 40 years of sin for the southern kingdom of Judah, the remaining two tribes, whose capital was Jerusalem. Forty years of sin prior to the captivity. But also, if this is taking place in 593 B.C., 92, uh, four, he's, he's, the siege that's going to, that he's predicting is in 587. Well, you, you, you jump ahead and he say, he's saying you're going to be here another 40 plus years as captives before you ever get to go home. Worst is yet. And then he goes on. He says, now, I want, you to, I want you to bake bread, but it's a limited amount of bread. I want you to drink water, but it's a limited amount of water because while Jerusalem is under siege, they're going to have a food and water shortage. And cook it on dong. I mean, build you, use human refuge and then later animal refuge, you know, ref, dong for the fire, which was uh, not uncommon for, them, for, for ancient people to use dong in their fire um, as a starter and so on. Um, but for the Jewish people, that it was impure. And, and, and he's saying symbolically through this action that you all have been an impure nation, sinning against God, and cooking like this to them was impure. And he said, you all are defiled, and I'm going to, as I, as you, as I allow the Babylonians to conquer you and deport you to their country, um, you're going to be defiled because you're going to have to live among pagans. Now, some of you say, oh, Steve, you know, okay, I get it. I understand the chapter. It's a great history lesson. What does that have to do with me? Is there a message in this for us? And yes, there is. You see, when you and I sin and we repent, ask forgiveness, God forgives us. And he restores us to fellowship with himself and he blesses us. But sometimes some sin is such that even after we repent and are forgiven, we have to live with the consequences. It is a lie 
It is a false hope. Just like these false prophets were given the Jewish exiles false hope they would go home quickly. It is a lie. It is a false hope to think that simply because you repent and ask God's forgiveness that God automatically cleans up the mess you made. Does God lead you into a new future? Yes. Does God bless you with new opportunities? Yes. Does God make a way for you? Yes. But sometimes as you walk into the future, you have to carry some of the baggage of your past. Things don't automatically, you know, the, 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 sin has consequences. And I want to say to you young people listening to me, and to you young married couples listening to me, don't you dare turn your back on God. And, and, and young married couples, don't you dare take God for granted and forget God because you may just find yourself in a situation, young person, young husband, young wife, young college, you may just find yourself in a situation with the kind of sin that, that creates a mess in your life. And yes, God forgives and God restores and God heals and God blesses and God has a future, but some of the baggage may always be with you. And if you don't want to carry that baggage with you through the rest of your life, don't be stupid when you're young. That's the message. That's the takeaway from this chapter. Something to think about. I'll see you tomorrow.